is a very special day because it is a day about the Buddha. Sometimes Vesa Day is also called the Buddha Day. And uh, Dato Sri has covered actually yesterday uh, if we can still remember the making of the Buddha. And part of what Dato has covered is about the rare of, is the appearance of the Buddha in Dhammapada 182. And we all know uh, in Dhammapada 182, the Buddha says, Rare is above as a human being, heart is the life of the mortal, heart is the hearing of the Dhamma, and the last one is the rare is appearance of the Buddha. And actually, how rare is the appearance of the Buddha, actually, when we look at it, uh, because it's so rare, uh, which has been explained yesterday about uh, um, many asankeyas and many kalpas before a Buddha comes into a world cycle. And this very world cycle, we have five. Buddha actually uh, supposed to be in this world cycle before it destroyed and then uh, and, and basically completely gone. So we have just had the Gautama Buddha and the next coming one is the Maitreya Buddha. Now about this uh, in the Anguttara Nikaya it is mentioned uh, in this world there arise uh, a very unique being and this unique being when it came to this world it bring benefit and happiness out of compassion for gods and men. And who this bring? This being is what we call the Buddha or the Tathagata. So tonight I would like to share with you a little bit about his mission, why he did all these things. But for us to understand the mission of the Buddha, when we take a look at actually the life of the Buddha uh, for the 80 years that he spent uh, on earth, and when we take these 80 years of his life and... Uh, this 80 years of his life is all full with aspiration and inspiration. In fact, we can take this 80 years and break it into two phases of his life. Uh, let's take a look at it. The first phase of the life of the Buddha actually begins uh, from the day he was born till the day he got enlightened. That's the first phase before enlightenment. And there's a lot of personal mission for himself to actually reach in to seek for perfection and liberation. That's the first phase. The second phase, if we were to break the Buddha's life into two phases, is after his enlightenment. This is a place where, this is a phase where he actually reached out after his enlightenment, out of compassion for the world itself. And when we look at these two phases, this is very interesting, because we have to look at the Buddha in these two phases. First part is all about his enlightenment, his liberation, how he get out from the cycle of birth and death. The second part is about how you reach out to people and help people to get out of the cycle of birth and death. So when we look at this, the first part or the first phase, it's actually his mission about the perfection of wisdom. The second phase is about his perfection of compassion. So when we look at the Buddha's life, we have to look at it from a very different perspective of each of these different phases. First phase, is the early chapter of realizing the supreme potential. Here, when we talk about his first 35 years of his life, is about his journey to awaken the potential within him. So we all know the story of the Buddha of his birth, and of course, his renunciation, and eventually his enlightenment. And all this that he has gone through for the first 35 years is nothing but to realize the greatest potential of any sentient beings. And he has proven to us that it is possible, of course, through a lot of hard work, a lot of hard effort and cultivation along the way. But what we are more concerned of when we talk about the mission of the Buddha is not so much of that first part. The first part is something like when we learn the seven habits of highly effective people, Stephen Covey say, you have your personal victory. But there's also another part of the victory. It's called the public victory. So actually what the, uh, Stephen Covey has mentioned in the seven habits is exactly what the Buddha has gone through. The first part of his life is about personal victory. Then the second part of his life, after the 35th year, is about public victory. This is a phase which I call the compassionate uh, phase, which is a very important phase because without this phase, we could not see how compassionate the Buddha is. We will only probably know how wise was the Buddha in terms of his wisdom, but we are not able to see his wisdom. 
So the phase two of his life, after 35 years old, after enlightenment, uh, actually this phase is a very critical phase. So for the next 45 years after his enlightenment, he began the new chapter of his life with his mission of compassion. And the Buddha worked diligently, you know, for the good of gods and men, and especially for mankind. And this we know, the Buddha for the next 45 years, he actually spent seven days a week, 23 hours of awakened moments. According to the scripture, he slept one at most two hours in a day. Of course, we don't encourage you to do that because you're not a Buddha. But the Buddha basically, yeah, uh, uh, basically showed to us that for him uh, to reach out to the world, he could not waste any more time. In fact, he spent a lot of his time for mankind. So if you time 45 years by seven days in a week, by 23 hours in a day, how much time did the Buddha give to mankind? For that, we must be grateful that the Buddha actually cared for us and he gave his, the best part of his life to all of us. Okay, And that's because of his mission of compassion. Let's take a look about the mission of the Buddha itself. Now, after his enlightenment, after he has basically gone to the five monks, and from the five monks, there were later 60 arahants, and he gathered enough people. Uh, so the Buddha gathered these 60 arahants, and he gave his important message to these 60 arahants. And I would like to read this from the scriptures, uh, from Vinaya 1, uh, uh, verse 11 to 20. The Buddha says, Go forth, O Bhikkhu, to the 60 Arahants, for the good of many, for the happiness of many, out of compassion for the world, for the good benefit and happiness of gods and men. Let not two of you go by the same way. This is very interesting because the Buddha basically says, I do not want each one of uh, two, three of you go into one direction. I want 60 of you to go to 60 different directions. That's the spirit the Buddha wanted. Uh, they to uh, them to reach out to the world. Preach Oviku, the Buddha says, the Dhamma which is excellent in the beginning, excellent in the middle, excellent in the end. We heard this many times before. I have no time to go into this detail, but that's what the Buddha says. The Dhamma is good for all occasion and all time. And the Buddha says, preach the Dhamma both in spirit and letter. Letters are words. And in other words, the Buddha says, just do not preach alone. You must do it in action. That's where the spirit is. And proclaim the holy life altogether perfect and pure. Now, the reason the Buddha says this is because the Buddha says, there are beings with little dust in their eyes who not hearing the Dhamma will fall away. There will be those who will understand the Dhamma, even though the Dhamma is very difficult. And the Buddha says, I too, Obiku, will go forth to Uruvela to teach the Dhamma. So when we look at this, Vinaya 120 here, we realize that actually Buddhism is the first organized missionary religion in the world. There's no other parts in the history we can find a teacher who organized a very structured way of organizing a missionary work. And Buddhism actually is the first missionary religion in the world, not Christianity or any other religion. Buddhism is the first very well organized missionary religion. But unfortunately for all of us as Buddhists, we have forgotten about that. We think our religion is not a missionary religion. We think this religion is about self-cultivation, which is not true. The Buddha has shown to us through this, that actually you should go out, out of compassion for the world, for the good of the world. And his mission, as what is mentioned just now, is to clear the dust in the eyes, he understood that Dhamma may be very difficult for all of us, but there are those who are like those lotuses as he pondered before he went out to preach to the world. There are those lotuses that is deeply buried in the mud. There's no way to help them. There are those lotuses already blooming very beautifully. They don't need the help. But there are those lotuses that is hanging in between the water surface and the pond itself and the, you know, the air itself. These are the lotuses that need help. These are the people that we little dust in their eyes. And therefore, out of compassion for the world, the Buddha reached out 
uh, to the teachable people so that they also can be enlightened like him. And that was his mission of compassion. For that, we know that uh, the Buddha's mission is to help the world, to help people who have little dust in their eyes so that they also can get to know the Dhamma and benefit from the Dhamma and liberate themselves from suffering. But he did that not because he wanted, his mission was to convert people. That was never, never his intention. And we see time and time again in the Buddhist life of the Buddha, in the Buddhist scripture, the Buddha was not interested in converting people to another religion or to his belief. In fact, there's a story about Upali, uh, the Nigantas follower. The Nigantas are the Jains, the Jainists. Uh, Jains are another religion which was very prevailing during the Buddha's time. And the Buddha basically, to cut the story short, basically managed to convince Upali that there is a way out to suffering. And because of that, Upali accepted the Buddha as his refuge. He took refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. And because of that, he wanted to take refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. The Buddha basically asked him three times to reconsider. And actually, and the Buddha says, you know, uh, you should consider whether you really want to take refuge in Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, because what I taught you was good is for your own good. And of course, Upali wanted to do that. And uh, the Buddha says, I was, you know, I am not interested whether you, you, you take me as your teacher or not, but as long as those things benefit you. And this is what Upali says after the Buddha said that, oh Lord, if I had been a follower of another religion, they would take me from street to street in a procession, proclaiming that such and such a millionaire has renounced his former religion and embraced theirs. That's what Upali says. If it had been other religion, they would have paraded him and maybe carried banners to say, you know, Upali now is the follower of the Buddha. But the Buddha did not want it. Yeah? But, oh Lord, you advised me to investigate further. So I'm pleased with this remark. So this is found eh, in Majjimadi Kaya 56 of the Upali Sutta. Again, this proof, the Buddha's mission is not to convert people. The Buddha's mission is to help people out of compassion. And the message eh, about the Buddha's mission is very clear. Two things. Suffering is optional. Happiness is a choice. That's what the Buddha wanted all of us to remember his teaching. It is to take us out of suffering. You don't have to suffer. Even the world is filled with suffering. And you can make a choice in your life to be happy, to get out of suffering. And to do that, of course, his whole life, the 45 years of his ministry, was to teach us on what is happiness and what are the choices that we have. And we know in the Four Noble Truth, the Buddha has basically clearly given us a very good picture on how to do it. In fact, if we were to look at the Four Noble Truth, which I think all of you who are Buddhists are very familiar with, First Noble Truth, suffering, the Second Noble Truth, the origins of suffering, and the cessation of suffering, and the way to the uh, cessation of the suffering. This Four Noble Truth itself, uh, in Chinese we call it Si, uh, uh, si Shen Ti, this four itself. And when we look at this, the Buddha was trying to tell us that if you look at the first two noble truth, it's actually negative. Is this what your life going to be? Do you want to live a negative, suffering life in your life? And all this, the, all you want to live a life which is full of happiness and success and goodness. And for this, the Buddha has basically mentioned to us this four noble truth is to show to us that actually there's always a cost to a negative life. There's always a cost to a positive life. The choice is us. And making choices in our life, the beautiful thing about the Buddha's mission is as he teaches the four noble truths, he is not forcing us to believe it. And he says we can have a good life, a wholesome life, a successful life, you know, a happy life. All this can be done without the idea, the concept of a God. Isn't it wonderful? The Buddha has shown us a way how to be happy, how to get out of suffering, and how to find salvation, liberation, perfection, without the idea of a God. 
And this is found in the Four Noble Truth. And that mission, he has been very consistent for the uh, good 45 years of his ministry. So when you look at the life of the Buddha and his 45 years of mission of compassion, it is not about preaching alone. The Buddha did not spend his life, 45 years of his life after his enlightenment, preaching to the world. In fact, it was through his action, his compassion, his love, is care for the uh, for mankind. And this, again, we can see again and again in the scripture, how he comforted the, the uh, Bibrif Tatachara who lost the entire family within a day itself. How he counseled Kisa Gautami who lost the death of her only child. Uh, how he actually uh, make her to come to accept the death of the child. And how actually... He administered the sick, like Putigata Tisa Terra, where nobody wants to touch the, the monk, you know, who is very sick, but he went there personally to, you know, nurse the monk itself. And how he actually helped the poor, you know, the neglected like Sopaka, and how also he transformed the life of criminals like Angulimala. And all this was done by him with action, not words alone about preaching, it's about action. So his mission for 45 years is a mission of compassion, is a mission of actions. And next we see that actually his 45 years also, apart from mission of love and compassion and care, is also a mission of transforming and reforming the way people look at things, the society at that time. And one of the things that he did quite, uh, he did, he was quite strongly against was the caste system of the Indian society at that time. We know those days for religious related matters, the Brahmins, they were the one who are in charge and in control. But the Buddha broke down that basically paradigm by allowing people even at the lower caste to basically become a member of the you know, order of Sangha. We have people like Upali who is a barber, Ambapali who is a courtesan, came from a very low, but she was very beautiful, but she came from a very low uh, level of the society. The Buddha accepted them into the order. That was something the Buddha did very well to transform the society. And the Buddha also raised the status and equality of women. Never before in the history has women been given that opportunity as the Buddha have given to the women of the world at that point in time. He started the first spiritual order for the women. You know? In fact, he has Arahan Kema and Upalawana. These are the chief disciples of the Buddha who basically have that status in his order of Sangha itself. Never before the Buddha did that because he was very concerned about the women. In fact, he felt women can sometimes be better than men in many ways. And he gave that opportunity. And the Buddha also protects the life of the animal. We know the story of King Bibisara who wanted to slaughter thousands of animals as a sacrifice. The Buddha was there to stop him from doing that. And in the Brahmana Dhammika Sutta, again, you can search for it, how the Buddha basically discouraged the Brahmin from sacrificing his animal. And that shows that actually he has compassion not only for human beings, but also for non-human beings, the animals itself. So, and I think one of the biggest contribution the Buddha has ever given us in his mission is about our, you know, about the charter of free inquiry in the Kalama Sutta itself. The Buddha was very concerned about the people's thinking at that point in time, where people are actually entrapped with the old belief, their religious belief at that time. But the Buddha says, do not believe anything on accounts of traditions on account of your holy book, on account of your teachers, and many other things eh, that he mentioned in Kalama Sutta. When we study carefully this Kalama Sutta, never before has any religious teacher also given the freedom for his follower to basically question the teaching that he has taught. Only the Buddha did that. For that, we must say that actually, he basically, you know, started the movement of critical thinking, of paradigm shift in the world itself. That was the Buddha's mission. 
because he did not want us to blindly believe, blindly accept things. So when we talk about the mission of the Buddha for the first 45 years, we understand that he was a man who go all the way for the mission. But this mission is not an easy mission. We know his mission is never, never uh, free from a lot of insults, criticism, and even conspiracy by others towards the Buddha itself. I give you some example. Because of his wholesomeness and greatness itself, some of his contemporary at that time, the Brahmin, the Jains, they were not very happy with because a lot of their followers started to become the Buddha's followers. And many of them threw insults, criticism on the Buddha. For example, the Akul, Akusa, the story of Akusa, Akusaka here. Yeah. And he basically threw insults at the Buddha uh, when he would, wanted to invite Buddha for meals. But instead of giving the meals, he insulted the Buddha. You get people like, you know, Brahmin, who says the Buddha was an outcast. And the Buddha defined what you mean by outcast. And you got the entire citizens of Magadha at that time who accused the Buddha of breaking up families because they all became monks and he said he was actually, a, you know, he, he basically a family breaker. He breaks the relationship between father and son and, and, and members of the family. So the Buddha was never free from insults and criticism. Secondly, because people could not stand him, because of his mission, he also faced other things like conspiracy. There was this group of Brahmin who could not stand him. And they basically engaged this lady by the name of Chincha. You can find out more about the story who disguised the pregnant women. And this lady has been going in and out of the Buddhist monastery at that time. And people say that, you know, maybe the monks or the Buddha basically have basically make him make her pregnant. And of course, eventually the story goes that and it was actually not true. It was just another conspiracy. And also, there was also a, a situation where the Brahmin uh, killed Sundari, uh, got somebody to kill Sundari, Parivajika, Pari, uh, Pavi, Parivajika. And they tried to claim that actually it was the disciples of the Buddha, the monks, and the Buddha basically was killing him. So all this was set up by people who basically are enemies of the Buddha at that time, who couldn't stand his success. So mission is a mission, but mission is never you know, uh, free from all these problems that the Buddha has to face. And of course, one of the biggest enemy the Buddha ever had in his lifetime is Devadatta. You can read the story about Devadatta. In fact, he was the number one enemy of the Buddha who basically caused schism to the Buddha. And in fact, he instigated the young prince, you know, Ajatasattu, to go against his father like a political coup. And he instigated the, some of the weaker monks to be on his side and cause schism in the Buddha. Now, why do I show all this? It's very simple. The Buddha had a mission, but the mission was not a smooth mission. Along the way, there were problems, there were issues, there were criticism, there were insults, there were even, you know, conspiracy. But the Buddha took it all with his wisdom, with his patience, and with, with, with his kindness and compassion. So, to end my sessions, I want to talk about Mission Impossible. Here is Mission I Am Possible. Uh, it's not impossible. Today is Vesak Day. Vesak is not just a day for us to celebrate and uh, just light candles and offer some flowers and offer some prayers and things like that. It's not just that. Those are good devotional things to do. But today is also an important day for us to have a deep reflection. What can we do to uphold and continue the Buddha's mission after what I have shared with you today? Are we just a receiver of Dhamma or a Dhamma giver? You see, a lot of time we go to Buddhist centers to listen to talks. We read a lot of books. You know, we are receiving Dharma, but we are not giving the Dharma to people. Not like what the Buddha did 2,600 years ago. His mission, remember, his first missionary of 60 arhans to 60 different directions. He was giving Dharma to the world. We are receiving Dharma. We are not giving Dharma, some of us. So we, let us reflect. 
for us to continue the mission of Buddha, we need to be a Dharma giver to our family members, to our colleagues, to our friends, to anybody that we come across. And how can we follow? It's also a time for us to reflect in terms of the mission of Buddha. How can we follow the footsteps of the Buddha with mind filled with wisdom, with eyes full of loving kindness, with a heart moved by compassion? Can we do this more in our daily, day-to-day -day practice every day so that we can reach out more to the world just like the Buddha have done? And most importantly, how can we be more resilient like the Buddha, having a mission, but it's not an easy mission. There'll be time we will feel down. There'll be fine, the time we will be criticized, insulted by people. How can we bring ourselves up again so that the mission can continue? So the, knowing the great mission of the Buddha today is to renew our faith with this amazing man, uh, this extraordinary man, which we call Siddhartha Gautama the Buddha. And, you know, we hope today's talks will give you some idea about the Buddha's mission, especially after his enlightenment of 45 years. And, you know, we can learn one or two things from him so that we also can take his footsteps. Thank you very much. And may you have uh, a good way, sir. Uh, and all of you be well and happy. Sir,